Uh, I want to thank you all for inviting me and, and to, for Tim to bring me up. Um, my name is Scott Collin, as he mentioned, and I'm an uh, advertising creative director in Washington, D.C. Uh, I can promise you in my world this is considered a tuxedo, so I did dress up for the <laughs> event. Um, I have uh, a family, a great family. I've got two young children. My son is six, my daughter is 14. She's about to go into high school, and I think between the two of them, they will kill me long before anything else is done. But I also do have uh, a rare form of sarcoidosis that affects my lungs, my liver, my spleen, and unfortunately my heart. Um, and that's what I was asked to come talk about today, is not the disease itself per se, but my experience in having it. Um, and unfortunately with having it, I spend a lot of, or have spent a lot of time in hospitals and with doctors. Um, the one thing I think I, I figured out real quick with hospitals is, is, is uh, and we can all agree, it is a business. Um, there are efficiencies that need to be made. There are protocols to follow. Uh, at the end of the day, there uh, needs to be a profit. Um, but the more time I spent there, um, I kind of realized there's this other interesting thing that comes up, which is a playbook. And in, in healthcare, oftentimes you have a playbook. If somebody comes in with a certain injury, you know what to do next. If they have a certain illness, there's a series of steps that can be taken. And administration with um, healthcare and, and uh, uh, whether you have Aetna or another uh, company, there are certain things that are going to happen. As a patient, you don't have that luxury. You come in, you're probably at your worst, you're not feeling your best, that's for sure. And um, you're with, surrounded by a lot of people who seem to know what they're doing, and it can be a very scary thing because your whole life you're in control and now you have nothing to go for. Um, it seems kind of like a basic thing. When I thought about it, but the more I thought about it leading up to today, I realized just how important that is and significant that is because what I have found is along the way there have been a number of people who have kind of stepped away from that playbook and made a personal connection with me. And whether it's spending more time with me or not, they helped my recovery and they helped me feel more comfortable. And frankly, my family and my friends feel more comfortable by taking that extra little time. Um, so to kind of make that point, um, I thought I would share some, some fairly personal stories. Um, I've got a lot of tons. I could probably come back to the Tim Talk many times. But I selected a few that I think would help me bring this, this together. Um, some are funny, some are scary. Um, and for those of you who saw Tim's talk, that's the last story I want to talk about. It really just does defy all odds. Um, I joked with my, my brother-in-law. I have a brother-in-law who's a, a best-selling fiction author that our story is something he can never write about because no one would ever believe it. When you look at the numbers and how it happened, it just doesn't make sense. But it did, and it made sense for a reason, and I'll get to that. So before I get too far in, I wanted to just give a little bit of background um, to where I came from. Um, this is me at the end of 2011. I'm the one in the back. Um, <laughs> I had just completed what's called P90X. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. It is a cult-like workout system that I was tricked into doing, and it turned out to be brutal and phenomenal all at once. It was 90 days of terror that I fell in love with. Um, when the, this photo was taken, we were in Puerto Rico on a vacation. Um, I was probably in the best shape of my life since I had been since college. Um, I was sleeping great. I'm a lifelong insomniac. I felt great. My workouts made me energetic. Um, I, had, I had the energy to keep up with this guy, which is, is saying something, but I was just happy, healthy, and having the time of my life. Soon after this photo was taken, though, I developed a cough. Thinking it's allergies or a cold, I didn't think much of it until it worsened, and it continued to get worse. And a month and a half later, I realized I had cracked two ribs from all the coughing and went to see a doctor. Um, and they assured me it was asthma, gave me an inhaler, and said this is nothing, it'll, it'll pass. Um, and it didn't. And during that time, I also started to experience some arrhythmias in my heart, um, which I wasn't that burst on, but at night I knew that my heart was racing erratically and going from zero to 90, it felt like. And skipping beats, which I later found out was PVCs, uh, preventricular contractions, but it was all very discerning. So I went back to my doctors, 10 seconds on an EKG, they said it looked great. And this became but repetitive. I would go back feeling worse, they would hook me up, I looked fine. It's happened about five times. Um, and the thought was maybe I was stressing because of work. And, uh, but you know your own body. And if I've learned 
one thing personally throughout all of my experiences, you do know your own body and you know when something's not right. So I went back to my doctors and I asked them to please do more tests, and they did. They ordered up um, a giant battery of tests, and I went in on a Wednesday and gave more blood than I'd ever given. I gave urine samples, I gave probably untold samples. Um, and I was also sent the very next day to do a heart stress test, uh, and I passed with flying colors. The only thing they saw on that test was that my heart was a little bit enlarged, but they thought that might be sleep apnea or something else. They said my heart looked great. So I was very frustrated. But the next day, uh, I received a call from one of my doctors. He said they had found some very alarming things in my blood tests. And they said, maybe Monday you should come back in and take some more. We want to investigate this further. That was Friday night. Um, unfortunately, I did not make it. On Saturday, uh, visiting with uh, family, I uh, was not feeling good, and I started to go numb. It started in my face, and I found that I wasn't able to talk. And then my arms followed, and my hands, and it started to go down from my waist, and I started to pass out. And I think the last of things I said was, go somewhere. I'd lost all my color and I was raced to uh, Reston Hospital. And when there, they hooked me up to machines and I pretty much set off every alarm that I could set off um, and was in the middle of a trachealar tachycardia, which I've since learned is probably the most uh, deadly of all the arrhythmias. Uh, it's pretty fast and, and not something you want. Uh, and it took the better part of uh, 24 hours for them to um, bring me down to a place where I was a little bit safer and stabilize my heart. Um, so I went from this in a very sh short few months, thinking I was on top of the world, quickly to this, and then more to the point, that. And that's me today. Um, and this is a visual that I will sometimes share with friends who are inquisitive and want to know. And it's, I think for everybody in this room, maybe it's OK. It's nothing very special. It's pretty common. But uh, as a patient, this is um, this is something I wake up with every day and I know it's there. My kids call me Iron Man and think it's cool. Um, based on what it's done for me since getting it, I think it's cool as well. But again, from my perspective as a patient, this is a very scary thing and it's a reminder of something that um, I certainly don't want to have. And I think this will bring me to my first story. Um, When I was rushed to the rest of the hospital, um, and I spent all that time there, um, it was hard for me to take in what people were saying in the midst of everything that was going on, my fear and my anxiety and seeing my family's anxiety. They finally left in the middle of the night, um, having, having drugs pushed into me. Um, again, I go back to the fact that I didn't have the playbook. I didn't know what was next. Um, and this was one story that was really tough. It was a kind of a brutal entry into all this. About 7 a.m., the first cardiologist that came in and saw me, I had never met, walked into my room, stood at the end of my bed, clicked his heels, took a deep breath, and said, we may be looking at a transplant situation. Do you have any questions? And the room went silent, and I began to laugh. And uncontrollably, I began to laugh, and which made me cough and laugh. And it just didn't make sense in my head that there was no welcome and how are you doing, small talk, and I buy you a drink. It was literally, we may have to take your heart out of your chest. And I didn't know what questions to ask. I actually asked him to leave uh, because I didn't know what to do. Amazingly, within an hour, probably within a half hour, a second doctor came in. Instead of it being at the foot of my bed, he came over and sat down and pulled up a chair next to me. He asked how I was feeling, and he asked what I knew. He asked what I had been told, not if I had questions. So I ran down the litany of things I'd been told, what they suspected was happening, and the fact that I believed I was probably going to have a heart transplant. And his jaw dropped, and he just said no. And he put a big smile on his face, and he said, that couldn't be further from the truth. Made me no promises. But based on what he was seeing, he said, one, I was incredibly lucky it was caught. Most people in my situation would have dropped dead with the BT, and that's that. They don't catch it with sarcoidosis. Mine was caught. And two, we were at the start. Um, I had a strong heart. The function was strong, it was the disease they needed to treat and what it was doing to the electrics in the world. And the greatest thing that came out of his mouth was, we have a ton of we have a ton of tricks up our sleeves. And he said that a few times. And I think everyone in here probably knows which doctor I preferred. Because I walked away from that with hope. And then when my wife and kids came in, I had something positive to share with them. And I'm sort of a pessimist in my life, but I became an optimist. I had to. And I think that's one of the other big things I've learned is you've got to be your own advocate and you've got to be optimistic. Um, two different approaches. 
but one that stood out to me, um, and I don't see that second doctor on a daily basis, but I do see him when I go in to see my cardiologist all the time, and we, we talk on a friendly basis, and he's, a, he's an incredible person who's inspired me a lot. Um, some of the other people I've, I've met with and seen and spent a lot of time with over the last few years are EMTs. Um, as a kid, all I wanted to do was ride in an ambulance. That was it. I didn't want to be on a fire truck. I didn't want to be in a police car. I didn't want to meet celebrities. I wanted to ride in an ambulance. As an adult, I don't care to ever do it again. It wasn't fun. And it's, it's just a quiet place where a lot of things are either happening fast or you're sitting and thinking about something you don't want to think about. I have two great stories to share about this that uh, I think I will never forget. Uh, and the, fun, uh, the first one, I, I think it's pretty funny, uh, goes back to Reston Hospital again. Uh, jump forward. Um, after receiving uh, or after uh, receiving my diagnosis, it was decided I would be moved to another hospital and specialize in what I needed. I was going to have my first cardiac MRI to verify uh, that I do have cardiac sarcoidosis, and then I was going to receive my AICD. So they sent three young people in to, to uh, move me by ambulance to the other hospital. Uh, very young, and it was kind of fun listening to them uh, and just kind of their talk and their chatter. Um, I had offered to just walk because I, I just wanted to get up and walk out and they said that that wasn't protocol and that wasn't going to happen. So I strapped into my little bed, all my machines were moved and made portable and we wheeled towards the doors. Uh, and as we got outside, uh, it was a beautiful day and I had been pretty scared for a number of hours of, you know, solid 24 at least, been through a lot and to feel the warm sun was a pretty amazing thing on a couple levels. One, I felt like I had gotten past stage one. I made it out of this hospital, which was pretty significant. Uh, and I asked the young gentleman to my left if, if I could just have a moment, if I could just sit in the sun for a second before we took off. And he said, absolutely. So I did. I laid my head back and closed my eyes and just enjoyed the sun and the breeze and some birds. Um, it wasn't that long of a time, but I just needed it. When I was done, I looked over and I said, all right, let's do this. And his response kind of caught me off guard, and he said, Do you sure you don't want a little more time? And again, there's the seed of doubt that comes in with that. And I said, No, I think I'm there. Why don't we move on? <laughs> and he once again said, Are you, are you positive? And I saw him turn, and, and over my shoulder I see, um, I call them the three amigos, look back at him and kind of give a small shake, like they're shaking off a baseball player. Did. And he looks back and he said, You're sure? I said, I'm more than positive. I, I think we should go. And I happened to be in the fumes of the idling uh, ambulance. <laughs> And he came over and took a deep breath and said, we're locked out. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, I'm just going to enjoy the sun for a little bit. <laughs> so as we waited for him to get a key from one of his bosses that was driving in, he grabbed himself a coffee from inside, asked me if I wanted one. And I, as funny as the situation was, and thankfully it wasn't when there was an emergency, it was, it was a well-needed time. And, and I appreciated it. We had a great ride, and I've got a lot of other stories about the Three Amigos that I'll share someday. Uh, a flip side of this is uh, an experience I had later. Um, jumping forward to when my defibrillator uh, fired twice within a few hours. Uh, the first time at home in front of my six-year-old, when it scared the hell out of both of us. Um, and the second time uh, back at Reston Hospital after I'd been taken there by ambulance. Uh, this time it took a significant amount, of significantly more amount of time to uh, stabilize me, and uh, things got a little more dire. Um, and there's a part of the story that I'll jump to uh, in a moment to talk about that. I think you've had a little foreshadowing with Tim. But it was decided at this point that I needed to go to Hopkins uh, for uh, an ablation surgery. I've had two, and this was the first of my ablation surgery. So I, of course, got online and did a little research on ablations. And that didn't do much to calm my fears. I now realized I was going to have somebody going inside my heart, burning areas that were damaged and were causing the problems. Um, the crew that came and got me this time was uh, far more senior, and it was more quiet. We were leaving in the evening. Um, and if anybody's been in Northern Virginia, no matter what time of day, you're not going to have a quick ride out to Hopkins. It's brutal. And I knew we were going to be in traffic. Um, and on the way over, uh, it, I, I think the weeks that I've been leading up to this uh, just emotionally got the best of me and I became emotional uh, without really even noting why, it just it kind of came over me as a way. Without saying a word, the uh, most senior person, a uh, gentleman to my left, uh, had kneeled down next to me and was holding onto my arm and hand. And he didn't ask what's wrong, he didn't ask, you know, if I was in pain or anything, he just said, what are you thinking about? And I 
told my kids. And as much as I got into all this, I was more worried about them at their ages uh, having to do uh, and go through life without their father. Uh, and it was really playing on my mind. And for about the next 45 minutes, he simply talked to me about my kids and asked me questions about my kids. And I found that I was laughing and telling these goofy stories. My son is, is a complete nut job. So we were just having a good time or something. We showed up at the hospital, they took me up to my room, and before he left, he turned around and just said, you're going to be fine. And he just did it with confidence. And there was something about the connection we made that made me believe him. The part two to the story that I think is more remarkable is uh, I was there for four days prepping. I uh, had another cardiac MRI uh, before my ablation surgery. My ablation surgery lasted about six and a half hours the first time, and I went to recovery. And laying in recovery, kind of coming down off the pain meds and hallucinogens, there was a knock at my door, and it was him. And he came in and told me he had just been up to drop off another patient and asked the nurses if I was still there. He just wanted to come back and say hi and check in with me. And it was, I didn't know how to respond. It was a pretty amazing thing. And here's a guy who had the playbook and stepped away on something. He didn't need to see me again, uh, but he chose to, not as a uh, EMT, but as a friend. And it was moments like that that really started to change how I viewed my sickness and how I could be a better patient and how I could uh, be a better advocate for my future health. And I want to share one last story, and I think some of you who were here a few months ago sort of know where this is going, but it's still amazing to me, but I think it, it, it has a great point to it. Uh, chronologically, jump back in time again after I was um, taken back to rest and after my device fired a few times. Um, Stabilized before they transported me. I was in a, a really big room, actually. I just remember thinking they must have, at one point, to put, you know, delivered babies or something. <laughs> Very plush. I sort of like it. Um, and at one point, a nurse came in, um, but not by herself. She was with this tall, gangly guy in a suit I had never met before in my life. Um, and he seemed very official. Maybe some of you know him. <laughs> uh, and he introduced himself as the president of the hospital. So I was trying to figure out either somebody in my family pulled some strings and was going to make sure I was getting the best care, or I was in real trouble. And Tim uh, proceeded to tell me that this is just how he works. He likes to make rounds, and he likes to meet people, and he likes to see different faces and talk to people and find out how they're doing. Uh, and that's exactly what he did. It wasn't 20 questions, but he was asking about simple things, about being comfortable, and the food, and uh, you know, was there anything needed? Was I, was I comfortable? Did I need to get a stretch? I was asking a lot of really nice things, and I, and fortunately at the point, I didn't have anything bad to say about the care I was receiving at all. Um, and then Tim asked what I was in for, and I told him I was suffering from uh, sarcoidosis, a rare disease, and it was affecting my heart. I explained my device, and then it had fired. And as I'm talking, Tim lost all color from his face, and Tim abruptly left the room. And at this point, I figured I was, a, I was a goner. You know, the president of a, a hospital comes in and finds out what you have and flies out. I figured, he doesn't want this on his hands. <laughs> but amazingly, he came back in and he shut the door, and this time he was alone. And he sat down and had a very serious look on his face and told me, uh, well, first of all, asked me if I would please keep this to myself because none of his staff knew, but he told me he had exactly what I had, down to the device, which had fired. He had had an ablation surgery. Uh, at that point, which I was going to be going into. Um, the odds of that happening in that room are significant in that um, if you break sarcoidosis down to white men in the United States, about 5,000 of us, um, it's, just, it's just tiny. And Tim has some statistics in his talk that we had a better chance of hitting the lottery. Uh, more interesting, we had a better chance of dating supermodels. <laughs> 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 We got cheated, I think. <laughs> but I thought about that, and the, just the, the sheer odds of him choosing that hallway that day, me being in that hospital, is you can't explain it. But then you can, because Tim had, in his career, chosen to work that way. He could have stayed in his office and asked people what was going on. He could have not made these walks. He could have stayed away from all that. But he made the choice that his playbook was going to include making a human touch with people. And he did, and the results for me were amazing. We had a very long talk about uh, our condition. When he had to leave, he asked for my email address. Within an hour, I had an email that had over two and a half years of research on a very rare disease drop into my lap. 
I also had a list of doctors that he had seen that he recommended. I also had a list of procedures I might have to consider. I had a list of medicines that would probably be mentioned and his opinion on the medicines and what he had been told. And a lot of us defrayed that issue of going on to Google and no matter what, if you've got a headache on Google, you're dying. With our disease, it's very bleak, but he had the same outlook that he had been through, which is he had doctors who said, you probably don't have a lot of time, but he had those other doctors that did. And he was able to give all this to me, and, and it's, the, the, you can't put a value on that. So I, I kind of want to wrap this up by saying in conclusion that I, I, I thought last night, I was like, I want to challenge people to kind of take that approach to things, which is, you know your playbook, but every once in a while, whether it's once a week or even once a year, if, if you can find a way to step out of that and do something different and try to connect with somebody, um, I can promise you it doesn't go unnoticed. Uh, these are people at their worst, and they may not be ready to say thank you or have that ability. It does not go unnoticed. For me personally, uh, I've changed my life in that I look to pay it forward all the time, uh, whether it's just helping friends, and in some cases I've sought out other sarcoidosis patients online and given them the information that Tim gave me and my own personal experience, because I think it would be horrible if I didn't. I feel like that needs to happen. Um, just a few other examples. It's not just doctors and nurses um, who were all phenomenal, especially those who would sit up and talk to me at night when I couldn't sleep. That was awesome. But it's technicians who helped me laugh during painful procedures or x-rays or blood tests. Uh, administers who would either help fill in a lot of my paperwork or just kind of give me a break and let me, let me do it when I was ready for it. And, and that meant the world to me. Uh, to one of my favorites was a dietitian who realized I could not do the chicken again. And when I asked, promised to go make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, it was the best one I've ever had in my life. <laughs> it was such a nice break from the food. But it doesn't take much, and I have every expectation, and that's why when I thought about challenge, I wanted to kind of put that out gingerly, because I know and expect that every one of you do this, um, and you do challenge yourselves, and that's why you're here, and this is a great hospital. Um, but there's a staff that appreciates that, and I just hope you know there are patients that I'll leave you with this, because I think a lot of you are thinking, well, the whole Tim thing's pretty amazing. What's he get out of it? And I think he gets a lot, and it started with a year-long subscription to Cat Fancy Magazine. <laughs> 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 Neither of us own cats, but you can't tell me that doesn't bring a smile to you. <laughs> more recently, I sent him Dance Spirit Magazine, which is far more disturbing. But what I loved was Tim called me one day and said, did you do this? And someone sent him a teddy bear magazine, and it's not me, so the fact that somebody else is jumping in has completely yes. made me. But in all seriousness, Tim will forever have uh, a lifelong friend in me. Uh, he has my absolute respect, and I hope he has the satisfaction of knowing that he is making a difference, and that's kind of what all of you are doing. Um, I've been through the ringer, but I'm on the right side, and I just want to say thank you.